stuff. Okay, so one announcement at the beginning of class. Um, so there's a, there's a forum at this URL, which is pretty long, but if you go to the course webpage and then go scroll to the bottom, there's also a link to it. Uh, that's a <coughs> forum module moderated by my PhD supervisor at, at Riverside. And there's a bunch of people discussing this course and a lot of extra material as well. Okay, uh, before I get into the lecture proper, I want to clarify just quickly our use of the words pre-order and percept since we're being pretty informal about the distinction between them. So here's a definition which I'll state and then we'll probably just continue to kind of ignore. But a percept, short for partially ordered set, is a pre-order that obeys, thanks for that, um, this axiom that says that uh, if x is less than equal to y and y is less than equal to x, then x equals y. So we call this anti-symmetry. Um, so formally, most people use the word poset to mean this structure. That, so it's a, it's a set with an order that's reflexive and transitive and anti-symmetric. Um, but for our case, pre-order is, is a slightly weaker definition that is, is more natural from the point of view of category theory. And there's a nice fact that um, every pre-order, even though it seems like a weaker structure, is equivalent in some precise sense that I'm not going to tell you um, to a percept. So while there is a formal difference between the terms, for our purposes they are about the same and uh, if we say percept we probably really need pre-order and accidentally said percept because by this fact we don't really, we aren't too careful to the distinction. Okay. So let me move on properly to the class. Sorry, is the reason for that, the, that uh, instead of the equals there, you get an isomorphism? Yeah, uh, so, so for example, here's a poset. Oh, sorry, here's a pre-order, I'm already making mistakes, that is not actually a poset, because it has these two elements, um, and this is less than this, and this is less than this, but they're not equal, right? But this is somehow equivalent to just this poset, right? And so whenever you have a, a proper pre-order where there's lots of this stuff going on, uh, you just kind of quotient it all together and just consider the, the things where you consider anything isomorphic to actually be equal. Great. So I'm assuming like acting of choice throughout here? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Uh, I'm not going to be too precise about that either, I guess. Okay, so let me tell you about symmetric and order free orders. Okay, so first, let's from mind do what a monoidal free order is. So as we saw yesterday, a monoidal free order. Um, people also say pre-ordered monoid, uh, which was sort of the viewpoint that, no way, no, David took the monoidal pre-order viewpoint, anyway. Um, a monoidal pre-order, which we denoted by this tuple, where we had a set, a uh, order relation, a, um, I'm going to write the unit element first, and then the monoid operation, right, with this O-type symbol. So it's this data where um, so the monoidal pre-order is this data where P with this order relation forms the pre-order and I'm going to say that O times is a function from P times P to P. So this is just set theoretic for now but such that um, 
one goes to A, it's uh, unit, it, it's associated, this, this, this operation here forms a monoid, so it's associative. <coughs> we have this. It's unital, so it means that we have this. And then David said that this should be a monotone map. Um, so we have this monotonicity condition that explicitly says if a1, uh, let's say a is less than c and b is less than d, then a times b is less than c times d. Right? So that's what we saw yesterday. And we had these examples. where we had the Boolean, so this example ball has to set things true false, uh, where the order is this less than order that I saw yesterday, but it's, I'm just going to write implies, so false implies everything and true only implies true. Um, and then we have true as the unit and and, which is this neat symbol, as the the monoidal product. Uh, so actually, There's also another monoidal process pre order that's going to be important in this lecture, and this is called cost. So the underlying set here is zero infinity as a closed interval. So what does this mean? Um, this is all positive real numbers plus an extra element which we call infinity, which is considered greater than everything else. The order is going to be the greater than relation, not the less than relation. Um, so it's, it's reversed from what you might expect. Um, so in particular that this thing, this infinity element is the, I guess it should be considered the bottom element now. Um, but it's greater than everything else, so it goes before the symbol. Um, the monoidal unit is zero, and the monoidal product is plus, where anything plus infinity is equal to infinity. We did see that yesterday. And then here's another example. Um, given a set X, you might can take its power set, where the underlying set is the set of subsets, the power set. The order is inclusion of subset. Um, the monoidal unit is, well, the monoid operation is union, and the monoidal unit is the, sorry, intersection, and the monoidal unit is the, the complete set. Okay, so to review a few more things, uh, we also saw wiring diagrams. So what does this mean? Uh, so here we have our pre-ordered monoid. Wait, monoidal pre-order, same thing. Um, <coughs> using this notation. Okay, so. So in this wiring notation, this set is a set of wire labels. This order thing is where we can draw boxes. Um, this element is the, the, the unit is the ether or the ambient structure. And the times the monoidal product is, allows us to put things in parallel. Um, so what does this mean? Um, we have this notation where we can draw a box with some wires coming in, some wires going out, and they're labeled by elements of the free order. So A, B, C, D, and you can reuse labels, right? So A. Um, so this represents, um, so some arrow like that, this fact. So, so this, this notation here is an alternate notation for reasoning within a monoidal free order. So the usual notation is the one we've been using here, which is to write things like A tensor B tensor C, oh sorry, times is less than D times A. Right. But this is just an alternate notation for that expression. Um, and the point of this is that, um, let me use some space here, that in, say, this process here, cost, we can take some facts, like, I'm getting a bit small. 
we can take some facts like say 3 plus 3 is less than I don't know, 4 plus 2. Right? And we can take another fact. So, so that's what this thing represents, right? This is saying because our, yeah, I'm working in class, so I'm not a product is plus, and uh, our order is greater than, so this, this box represents the fact that 3 plus 3 is greater than 4 plus 2. Right? Um, and we can also have things like 3 is greater than here, 1. Um, and we can have, say, that 2 is greater than 0, but because of, of what David mentioned yesterday, the 0 can kind of be ignored, so this can kind of just fade out. Um, and we can take these expressions and put them together to form something like this. So we have 3 is coming in, 4, 2, and that fade out. <coughs> And so what does this mean? This is a proof that says from these three hypotheses, which have these corresponding interpretations here, we can derive this outer box, which represents that 3 plus 3 plus 3 is less than, uh, is greater than 4 plus 1. And so this is some reasoning you sort of might do in your head, and this sort of represents that process formally. Um, so what you might notice is that the axioms of the monoid preorder correspond to sort of intuitive things that you're visual cortex is doing here, right? So for example, if I have two boxes um, where two is greater than one and three is greater than one, then I can sort of put them side by side, and this says that three plus one is greater than one plus one, which is precisely this uh, monotonicity axiom down here. Okay, so now onto a new definition, so I promise to talk about symmetric monoidal preorders. Uh, a monoidal preorder is symmetric if it further obeys, let's just say it obeys, this axiom um, called symmetry, which says that uh, A times B is less than B times A. Right, so we'll call this um, symmetry. So I, this means that, in fact, because this is for all a, b, we have that for all a, b, a tensor b is equal to, sorry, a times b is equal to b times a, right? Um, so I, we always have this box, a, b, b, a. And then uh, remember when David started introducing axioms yesterday, so, so the point is that these boxes represent hypotheses that you're using to construct your your larger thing, right? So these are, I don't know, these are your hypotheses, or the internal boxes are the hypotheses. And then this thing here, the outer box, we'll call, I don't know, the conclusion or something like that, which is this 3 plus 2 plus 3 is greater than 4 plus 1. Uh, so if we uh, throw in more axioms, it's nice also to throw in more, uh, a greater sort of iconography, so the boxes truly represent hypotheses that come in from this, uh, the particular model, whether it be cost or whatever, instead of just the axioms. So in this case, we often say that in symmetric model categories, we have this icon that um, lets us swap things. Okay. So that's mostly our view. Um, oh, yeah, okay, I'll take a question. Uh, so does this mean that they're not commutative? Uh, but, hmm. No, it means they're commutative. But what prompts that question? As in, I, because of the difference between symmetry and commutative? Yeah. Uh, you might just call this commutative. The reason we use the word symmetric uh, is because in, when we go to a, a more general case, the categorical case, uh, we're more interested in the symmetric structure or the commutative structure, which where, in this particular case, commutative and symmetric are the same, but in the general case, symmetric is weaker and the more interesting structure. So I'm just using that word. But thanks for the question. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so
Well, they're the same up to isomorphism, but symmetry is... Oh, yeah, okay, we are doing three orders in our process. Um, yeah, commutative... Sorry, I said before that that implies equality, but I was using that assumption there that of anti-symmetry. So I take that back. This is slightly weaker, uh, precisely by the difference of that anti-symmetry axiom. So this implies that A tensor B is isomorphic to B tensor A, and yeah. not necessarily equal, and that's the distinction between symmetry and commutativity. Yes. It's a pretty minor distinction. Yes. So there, P should actually be like a bunch of lists of wire labels, right? Instead of just a set of wires? Uh, P... Like an element of P will be a finite list of wires, rather. But, so, this is a good question. Um, where, when David was doing stuff like the Kate diagram yesterday, uh, he sort of assumed that there were some generators to this monoid structure, and was only labeling wires for the generators. I see, um, okay. But you can do either, so I could, I guess implicitly I'm saying you can label wires with like 4 plus 1 or something like that, maybe. <laughs> okay, um, just to give everyone a chance to catch their breath, here's a question um, so that'll be relevant later. So does cost have joins? If so, what are they? Maybe I'll give it two minutes before we'll discuss that with our neighbors and also just discuss anything else they might have questions about so far. Um, Anyone around me want to talk about this? The element the element is zero infinity. Okay. The elements are okay. the real numbers of four okay. and um, yeah. We don't care about the So given to you, um, yeah, it's a lot of numbers. Can we find uh, something that's um, greater than both? Yeah. <laughs> Above both in this order. Oh, is this like, um, yeah. yeah, the real number. <laughs> Okay. Does anyone have any answers to this? Well, we'll find out. Question? <laughs> Okay. Um, anyone want to shout out? What, so first, what is the drawing? Uh, what, what does it mean to have a drawing? Hmm? Yeah, so you have a set and ask for a um, least stuff of output of that set. Um, okay, so, but we have something slightly tricky with the order going on, so what's, if I give, if I first give you two numbers, what's the drawing of those two numbers? Six and eight, or? Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Six and eight, what's the drawing of six and eight? Six. Six, right. So, the drawing, <coughs> drawing is the same as min. Um, if I give you no numbers, what's that, the drawing of that? Infinity. Infinity. So it's the least number that's, wait. No, it's the greatest, it's the greatest, greatest number. It's the greatest number that's less than, less than nothing, right? Greatest of things such that nothing, so it's just infinity. So I'm gonna write the drawing. The empty set is equal to infinity. Okay. So now we move on to categories. And I'll put and enrich the in parentheses. Okay. 
So I've talked about monoidal preorders, um, and the idea is that monoidal preorders or symmetric monoidal preorders structure the question of uh, well, how of getting from A to B. <coughs> So, in particular, if you ask something like, uh, can you get from A to B, um, that can be answered by, by yes or no, a Boolean. Okay. Or you can ask, how much does it cost to get from A to B? And that's answered by some positive real number that says it costs five or it costs infinity. Okay. And you can also answer question, ask questions like, um, how can you get? So what are the ways you can get from A to B? And so if you have a set X of ways from getting to, from A to B, then an answer lies in the power set of X. Okay. So um, how how does this notion of getting from A to B entail not just the set, right, but the the monoidal preorder structure? So an important notion when you think about ways to get from A to B is that you can go via other points, waypoints. Right? So in particular, if it sort of it costs, say you say we're ask, answering the question, how much does it go take from to get from A to B? And it costs four to get from A to C and three to get from C to B, then we want to for this data to be coherent. So the price of getting A to B has to be less than the price of getting from through from A to B through some other route. Right? So we have this expression less than or equal, I guess. Less than or equal, right? Um, because if this was if this was A, say, then we would just go through C and we could get that in seven. Right? So we have this sort of coherence condition on the um, on answering this question that says that we want something like four plus three to be greater than 6. Um, yes. OK. If we're sort of thinking about it in terms of ways, right? if we have some set of ways that say we can get from here by like boat or car from A to B, and then we can get from B to C to B by, by a boat, say, then the set of ways to get from A to B should at least contain boat, but it might also contain some other things like a train. So here again, we have this this idea, this coherence idea, that says that um, sorry for the small writing, that boat car intersect boat should be contained in this thing boat train. So we see ourselves using here this, this monoidal structure, right? This intersection here, this is the, the monoid, and this inclusion here is the, the order you see over there. Right? And similarly, here's the order, and here's the monoid structure. Okay. So, okay, so a definition. A let V, which is just some classical thing. And 
then a function which goes from x times x to p. And I'm going to call this function script c for category. Okay. So it's this data, it's just a set, and then for every pair of elements of the set, we get some element of our Minoto preorder such that we have two axioms. The first is called identity, and it says that E is less than C of X, X, for all X in X. So this is identity. The second one is called associativity, and this says that if we have three objects, X, Y, and Z, then then the, the element. So, so if we think of this preorder as this, this way is uh, data quantifying how much it takes from, to get from x to x, this says that it, um, well, <coughs> it's hard without an element of this, but the, let me interpret the associativity axiom. This says that the way of getting from x to y and the way of getting from y to z, when we combine it using the monoid operation, is somehow less than the way of getting from y to z, which is exactly this idea here. Why do you call it associativity? Do you mean composition? I'm oh, sorry, I mean composition. I don't know why I said associativity. Thanks. Uh, if anything, it's transitivity. Um, which I think is my next question for you. So. Question, um, what do A and B say when B is equal Question mark. Um, let's take a few minutes to discuss that, whoever's around. So, what happens is, uh, uh, you got right arrow, and it flies. False implies false, false implies true. Yeah, I think you used to call it less than. Or, sorry, true. Yeah. Uh, because, so, this, this uh, is saying a beat category has a set of objects. Even, even it's, 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 you've got a bunch of dots, and you've got this way given two dots. Uh, uh, of getting a um, okay. I'm I'm use use of your monoidal process. So that's why he's labeling those here. arrows uh, oh, as telling okay. you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. we can think of it as the cost or the distance to get the x one And number one says that, that uh, the cost of getting from x to x is um, is greater than any yeah, is, is, uh, well, okay. so, uh, so the, yeah, so the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. at zero, it, like e is less than or equal to the cost of Yeah, it's the cost, but it's the p-value cost. Is the cost of boolean like the cost of impossible versus possible, or seven, or whatever? Yeah, false is less than, and of course that's true. Yeah, yeah. And and when I say cost, you note that cost has the, the thing we call cost has the greater than or equal to. So like number B, part B there is going to be a triangle and so the cost of getting to Y plus the cost of getting to Y is bigger than the cost of getting to Y. So, oh, you were trying to answer the question, and you did for A. So, what does it say for B? Uh, okay. Um, anyone have any answers? 
So, what is A? Uh, C of x, x is always true for... Right. Well. So, so in, in particular, so more, yeah. uh, if we interpret that, it says that true is less than C of x, x. But true is the top element, so we always have C of x, x is less than true. So this is sort of equivalent to i.e. Um, C of x, x is equal to true, like you said. Okay. What's the second one say? Anyone? Shout out. Y and C of y, Z are equal to C of x. Right, okay, so let's, that's exactly right. Um, so let me copy that down. It says that, well, I'm going to say that, I'm going to use this notation like I used up there. So C of x, y, and C of y, z implies C of x, z. Okay, so now I want to use this notation instead of when I have uh, Instead of writing c of x, x equals true, I want to write the notation uh, x. Whenever c of x, y equals true, I'm going to write x less than y. Right? So this statement here says that x is less than x, which we've seen before. Right? This is reflexivity. So now what does this statement say? Does anyone want to shout out that? Transitivity, yeah. It says that. This, so C X Y it says that X is less than Y. Well, yeah, okay. And um, Y is less than or equal to Z implies that X is less than or equal to Z. So this is a transitivity. So I mentioned on Tuesday that another way of thinking about a pre-order is as a bull category. So pre-orders. Uh, is there anything weird about the fact that here C has to be a function, but when we define the orders, it could be a really an arbitrary relation? When we defined... Or did we not say that? So, the relation we said um, was a binary relation on X, which is exactly a subset. Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. So when we define pre-order, we said that uh, uh, less than is a subset of x times x. Right. Now we've said that right. we want instead a function from x times x to true-false. And it's a rather important observation in logic that these two things are the same thing. Right. So if we have a subset of x times x, how do we get a function from x times x to true-false? We send anything in that subset to true and anything else to false. Similarly, if we have a, a function like this and we want a subset, we just take the subset of elements that map to true. So this is a one-to-one -one correspondence that is heavily used in, in logic. Uh, we say that this thing is the sub-object classifier for set. And we'll see more of that in the seventh chapter, so in the last two lectures. Oh, sorry, sorry I'm, I'm still confused by the note under B. So is, like, are we saying C, are we defining C now to be less than or equal to, or? Ah, it's, yes, we are. Okay. So that's exactly this correspondence, which I guess I should have explained earlier then. Um, so instead of think, thinking of C as a function from x times x to true false, we can now think of it as a subset of x times x. And then I'm going to write x is less than y is, is sort of the truth value of this. It's, so, so this is either true or false, right? So you're just writing less than instead of c. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it says if this is true and this is true, then this is true. Okay. So to, maybe it will help slightly if I give an example. So um, here's an example of post-set uh, post of roots or something. So mangoes are great. Um, peaches are also great, but maybe not so great as mangoes. So are strawberries. And then bananas are okay. Nothing else is available. <laughs> right. So here's a poset represented by a Hasse diagram, as we saw the other day. Thinking of a poset as a V category, says that we have a set X. The set 
is, again, the same underlying set of the first set, so these four fruits. Um, the function is, says when something is less than another. So to represent a function from x times x to p, I'm going to write out a table. Um, and I'm apparently going to abuse p. So this p here is p for peach. So what's this function? It says exactly what I was just saying, that um, if, if something is less than something else, then it's true. So in particular, mangoes, Mango is what's the best way to do that? Mango is better than everything else. So if we put truth down here. Um, everything is better than itself, or at least as good as itself. It's probably the better way to say it. Um, maybe let's go here. Banana is so. Peach is better than banana. Strawberries are better than banana. Peaches and stro aren't better than strawberries. There's sort of no comparison between them. So strawberries are not better than peaches either. Um, bananas are not better than anything else. Peach is not better than mango, and strawberry is not better than mango. So this is this is this poset of pre-order as a pre-order, and this is this pre-order as a ball category. So let me make a note on that word there, enriched. Um, so these are often called enriched categories, or v-enriched categories. Um, but that terminology is slightly misleading because it makes it sound like the uh, v category or enriched category is a category with extra structure. Um, so you should think of this v more as like uh, a change of base thing, like in, in linear algebra, where initially people introduce uh, linear algebra matrices over the real numbers. And later on, they sort of say, actually, all we need to do this linear algebra stuff to, to compose matrices and so on, or talk about vector spaces, is to have the structure of a field. So now we're going to change base and talk about linear algebra over the complex numbers. And this has a slightly different flavor. You've got, say, the Jordan theorem takes a different, different form, but um, you can still talk, it's still some variant of linear algebra. Similarly, with category theory, most introductions to category theory, and as you'll see it in the standard math curriculum, you start with categories over set, which is a monoidal category, and not quite a monoidal preorder, but we'll get to that. Um, but we've sort of started with, with categories over different bases, in particular, the, say, ball categories here, which are preorders. Uh, Lee, you had a question? Do you see to suggest the term characteristic function? Uh, no, I used to just say it's the term category, but, but I guess that's convenient. Yeah. yeah, that's a nice button. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another important example of categories is cost categories. Um, and they somewhat crudely turn out to be very close to this notion of metric space, which many of you may have seen before. So let me tell you about metric spaces. Okay, so definition, a metric space is Set x a function, which we call the distance function, um, d from x times x to the positive real numbers, right there in zero infinity open interval, um, such that in the base four things. The first is that the distance from x to itself is zero. The second is that it's symmetric, so the distance from x to y is equal to the distance from y to x. The third is that I want to be the third. Ah, right, that was the second. Oh, 
The third is going to be that the distance, if the distance from x to y is zero, so if there's no distance between them, then x is equal to y. And the fourth is this idea here, known as the triangle inequality, which says that the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z has to be less than the distance from x to z. Greater than? Oh, sorry, greater than, yes, thank you. Um, so that is 4 plus 3 is, is greater than 7, is what we see up there. Okay. Uh, so, that's an example of a metric space. Well, a great example is Euclidean space. squared, then you have two points, x and y, and the distance from x to y is just the distance of that straight line between them. So we can check, for example, that the distance from x to x, we have a, this point here, the, dist the straight line between x and x has no length, so it's, the distance is zero. Um, it's symmetric, the distance from x to y is the same as the distance from y to x. Uh, if the distance from x to y is zero, then x and y have to be the same point, because any two points have any two non-distinct points have a sort of actual line between them. And the triangle inequality is what you get from Euclidean space. It's a well-known classical principle. Okay, but there are many notions of distance that are interesting but that do not obey these axioms. So let's think about some. One is some notion of effort. Right? So if instead of being on a plane, this was some sort of hill, um, and we had sort of x at the top of the hill and y at the bottom, then it takes no, no energy or no effort to get from x to y. It, the, something will just roll down the hill. Right, so, so this axiom C here that says that if there's no effort between them, then they're the same point is, is not obeyed. Um, you can also see that it's not symmetric because getting from y to x takes a lot more work than getting from x to y. So we also don't have that. Um, some other ideas, another idea is household distance. So, Hausdorff difference distance between two points or between two subsets, say, says us. Um, so we can talk about the distance between this set and, and this set, and it says that the distance of x from x to y asks if I'm any if I'm at any point in here, what's the or in the worst case scenario where I just know that I'm an x, how how far am I from y? Right? So if, I'm, if I want to know the distance from x to y, it's given by, this is probably the furthest point from y, and it's given by the length of this line. Right? Which is not symmetric, because if I ask, if I'm in y, what's the furthest point I can be from x, that's something like here. So the distance from y to x, this is distance from x to y, this is the distance from y to x. So it's a very, Important mathematical example of a of a metric or a metric-like structure that is not a metric in the usual sense. Although classically, Hausdorff distance is symmetrized. Oh, okay. But. Yeah, but there is no need to. We can we can handle that. Um, so let's see. I guess to give one other example similar to this might be something like walking distance. Um, I include this example because I want something that requires infinite distances. So, uh, in particular, I'm sort of taking issue with three parts of this definition. One is this, one, oh, there's B and C, but there's also this idea that distances must be finite. So, if you're looking at like the walking distance from here to Australia, uh, that's no, it's not possible to walk. So, we we might think about it, 
matching up with an infinite distance. Okay. Um, so, how can we rectify this, these issues with the notion of distance? Well, let's think about what a cost category is. Um, so, what is a cost category? Is okay. So it's a set X, and it's a function X times X to zero infinity closed, which I'll call P now, such that. So what does A say in this situation? It says that. The Minoto unit, where I have erased what cost is, but um, remember that it's zero infinity. Uh, what goes next? The order greater than zero plus. So the unit is zero, and that's going to be greater than the distance from x to x, for all x. And the second statement there, the composition statement, says that the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z is always greater than the distance from x to z. So we exactly have uh, this sort of corrected definition of a metric space, um, or this alternate definition of metric space, where we have condition A there and condition B here is condition D over there, and we've extended our, our domain where we're allowed to take values. So this is known uh, also as a Lovier metric space. Uh, Lovier is a great category for us. Okay, question? Um, can one do analytic limits using categorical limits? Like, like, can you do analysis this way? That's uh, roughly yes, I would say, but there's a lot to explore. Okay. I've only got about two minutes left. So I just want to make a note that uh, in the same way that you can present, you can take one of these diagrams, a directed graph, and get a, a pre-order. So you can, from, from a graph, you can get a bulk category. There's a way of presenting cost categories or getting Lovia metric spaces uh, from directed graphs. So, in particular, you might view a directed graph as labeled as, as a graph where the edges are labeled by true and false, but in particular they're all labeled by true. And if an edge is labeled by false, you don't draw it. Um, in the same way, uh, you can generate a, a Lovia metric space just by having a directed graph where there are things are labeled with distances. So let's pick sort of I don't know, three places around here, MIT, Boston Common, and the Aquarium. Um, and let's say for some reason we can only get, um, we can only take these paths. Um, we get some sort of metric space, or some Lovia metric space, by just writing down a, a directed graph with labels that say where we can go and how long or how much it costs to get between them. Um, and so the way this is done is that this presents a category where so we have these faces. That's a fish? Yeah, that's a fish for aquarium. <laughs> um, and what well, the distance from any place to itself is, is zero. The distance from MIT to say the aquarium is apparently four. Um, to Boston Common, it's five. From Boston Common to uh, MIT, we have to go via the aquarium. So we take the shortest path. So this is 11. Um, to the aquarium is eight. And then aquarium to MIT is apparently three and eight. Yeah. Anyway, so this, this takes a graph and generates a, a cost category. Um, and there are, there's a fun, fun way to do this with, to generate this thing. So a directed graph might more properly be this information without 
I guess these these paths that are longer than length one, right? We only want to record the edges, so we might say that the one one hop distance from here to here is going to be infinity. Um, you can't get from Boston Common to MIT in one step, or from MIT to the Aquarium in one step. MIT Aquarium. Um, and using some some notion of matrix multiplication, you can take any director graph, encode it as a matrix, and multiply those matrices out to uh, construct the, the function of the category itself, um, which is a super fun thing to do. And I can tell people more about that after the class ends now. <laughs>